Hello, everyone, and welcome to this BioXL webinar. This is number 65. Uh, the topic is going to be QMMM simulation of both fluorescent proteins and protein dynamics. So today we have two speakers, Dmitry Morozov from the University of Uvascula and Mirko Pavlikat from Forschungszentrum Jülich. Uh, I am Arne Prume, based at the University of Edinburgh. And with me is also my co-host, Alessandra Villa from KTH, uh, Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. To introduce today's speakers, uh, we have, uh, first of all, we will start with uh, Dmitry Morozov. Uh, Dmitry is based at the Department of Chemistry and the Nan Nanoscience Center at the University of Uvascula in Finland. His PhD research is focused on the development and application of hybrid QMM methods to study biological system properties. Since 2013, he's been working in the group of uh, Professor Gerrit Groenhoff, also at the University of Uvascula, as a postdoctoral researcher. From 2019, he's been working within the BioXL Consortium on implementing multi-scale methods to perform uh, simulations of chemical and biological systems. And Dimitri will be presenting on computational screening and properties evaluation of fluorescent proteins. And second, Mirko Paulikat uh, is based at the Institute for Advanced Simulation and Institute of Neuroscience and Medicine at Forschungszentrum Jülich in Germany. In his PhD, he investigated spectral properties and mechanisms of thiamine, thiamine diphosphate dependent enzymes. And then in 2020, he joined Professor Carloni's computational biomedicine group at Ulich as a postdoctoral researcher. Now, his research focuses on uh, molecular simulations of biological systems like um, no, using high performance computing uh, QM and QMM uh, approaches. And uh, from January of uh, 2021, he's been working also within BioXL Consortium on applying uh, the QMM software interfaces developed in the consortium to study proton dynamics of biomolecules in the gas phase. So, with that, I will hand over to our first speaker, Dimitri. Yep. Thanks, Anna. Okay. So uh, welcome to our webinar. So my part will be devoted to the computational screening of fluorescent protein mutants, sub-project of Bioxel, which we're handling in the University of Uvascula, uh, along with my colleagues. Uh, so basically, first of all, of course, I want to present, uh, maybe not of you are familiar with what is fluorescent protein, so I will talk a bit about this. So the fluorescent proteins, which actually discovery of that have been awarded with a Nobel Prize in, 20, uh, in 2008. Uh, so it's uh, proteins which are under certain conditions when you eliminate them with light, they also start fluorescing. And first uh, type of these proteins was found in 50s, I guess. And it was found in the Aquaria Victoria uh, jellyfish. And uh, when it was isolated and finally measured structure, it appeared to be that beta barrel structure with the chromophore inside. The chromophore is typically is looking like something like that. And this is actually, if you check, it's uh, made after catalytically out of three amino acids. So basically it's tyrosine, uh, glycine, and third amino acid can vary from uh, type, uh, depending on the type of the protein. And uh, of course, one of the features of that protein is that they're not just fluorescent, but they can be also made reversibly switchable. So it means that they can uh, reverse the switch between fluorescent and non-fluorescent states. Not all of them, for example, wild type JFT cannot, but many of them can. Uh, so applications, of course, there is a large variety of applications nowadays in the modern uh, bi biology because they are used as a biological markers for, uh, like for, 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 for imaging the living cells even. So here are some examples. Yeah, and they are, of course, because they are genetically encoded, they are very, very, have very large applications. So now it's even, you can dance, do something like that with the cats. And uh, of course, funny enough, that technique, which is also called uh, super resolution microscopy, yeah, uh, which I use as actually fluorescent proteins, have been also awarded the Nobel Prize uh, in 2014. So maybe you know that in even six years, you have a two Nobel Prizes for, for, from the same field, that this field is very important, yeah. Uh, so, but uh, why we want to study these fluorescent proteins? Well, because they actually can, be a large variety of them, and the fluorescence can span from the blue light up to the far red light. Yeah, uh, there is a large variety. So the idea is of basically sometimes you need a very specific protein for your very specific tasks, and that's why you want sometimes even to design yourself the protein. So and that's why where the, our computations could come into play. So and uh, we want to 
uh, we want to have a way how to design, we want to develop a way how to design uh, fluorescent proteins um, with the properties that will be needed. So for that, we developed within BioXL a uh, FluProCAD workflow, which is fluorescent protein computerized design, of course. And this workflow uh, consists of several uh, packages which are work to, working together. So uh, for that, we need, uh, as the input, we need some initial structure. And we need to know which mutations we want to insert into that structure. So basically, we need some crystal structure, we need mutations, and we need to know which properties we want to calculate. Uh, we then we do automatically add the all missing residues atoms. We can do that mutation using PMX. And then we have a several types of properties which, which we can calculate with that workflow. So apparently we can do a structure, uh, we, we can do a, how it's called, structure determination of the, prot uh, of the mutant. We can do uh, thermodynamic properties of the mutant. And we can do a photochemical properties of the mutant. So I will start first with uh, application one, which is predicting the structures. And uh, for that, we're using, uh, which is this part of the workflow. And uh, for that, I will use, uh, we, we, we're using, a, um, of course, clusterization. So basically what we do, we first generate uh, from the crystal structure and no mutations with generating the mutant structure, uh, initial mutant structure, then we relax it. We do a large scale, uh, we do a large molecular dynamical trajectory. Here it's example 100 nanoseconds, but typically it is more than 100 nanoseconds, much more. And after that, we pick uh, snapshots from this uh, trajectory and start clusterizing them uh, on, on the basis of similarity of the backbone chain. Uh, and uh, after that, we pick up that cluster structures and the most populated one will be, of course, in, in most cases, the most probable structure. And we're picking up the structure which are as close as possible to the center of the of the cluster, particular cluster. Uh, and thus we, we can predict what the structure will look like. Okay, uh, how it works, we are tested this on the set of uh, mutants of the GF, uh, fluorescent protein, which is called Teres Green, uh, which was done in collaboration with co 11 uh, experimental group here. So basically, we pick up a starting structure from the PDB, which is very well known for that protein. And we done uh, 14 mutants in total. So here is just six, but we done over 14, 14 mutants for, for which we did not knew a crystal structure at all. So we first done our simulation and then we blindly checked that against uh, the crystal structure which was measured afterwards. And uh, here is, uh, what we, we, we get in the results. So first of all, of course, we observed that some of the mutants, so it's basically a MSD plot. And this is the same, but in the, in the, in the frequency domain, basically. And uh, what we see is that uh, some of the structures, they're showing double peaks, like this black one, which is the first one, or this uh, magenta, which is this one. Uh, so there is up to five facing structures. We show in the double peak, uh, double peak in RMSD meaning they, they have more than one cluster, typically. And we investigated all of this. And what we found that most of these clusters, the problem comes with, uh, no problem, but the feature which determines this comes in the, um, with uh, amino acids on the, uh, on the surface of the beta barrel. Because what's happening, for example, between this and this and this mutant, you see that this uh, mutated histidine to serine mutation, it always in a different conformation in all these kind of mutants. And even in the in the crystal structure, it can flip in and out. So, uh, it, it have a different thing. And what we observe in, actually in the trajectories, so why there is such a double peak structure, uh, the thing is that this serine can flip in and out of the beta barrel in the dynamics. So basically this gives us an idea that uh, this uh, a protein not only have a crystal, in crystal structure, you'll probably find only one confirmation of this serine, but in most cases in the solution, it will have two structures and you need to take into account this uh, when you do a molecular dynamic simulation for the property evaluation that potentially you can have a several structures in solution in comparison to the crystal structure. 
But sometimes even in Crystal, you can see this heterogeneity. You know, there could be uh, two uh, position uh, PDB files support uh, several positions for the same amino acid in one file. Uh, so more funny situation is with these two mutants, which are uh, which are these two, which also have a double peak. Uh, here it comes that histidine itself and uh, this uh, amino acid, which we also mutate to histidine, it's either here it means E protonated histidine, HIP means W protonated histidine. Uh, we test, of course, for histidine, you need to test several uh, possibilities. Yeah, it can be protonated by E, it can be protonated by D, it can be W protonated. Yes, how it could not be deprotonated in most cases. So, and we see that that histidine is also because both of them are on the surface. So here is the surface beta barrel. It's also can flip in and out of the of the um, of the chromophore pocket and out to the solution. That you also need to take into account. But overall, we can say that uh, according to our simulations, so basically these uh, pink structures is experimental structures measured afterwards. And we see that in, in most cases we have a very good agreement, with the exception of this. Uh, uh, sometimes of these uh, se uh, several positions. But for example, in this structure, you can see that even in the experimental one, you have two positions of the same system. So we are not so wrong with this. And thus we can confirm that we can predict the structures quite well of the mutants. Even we can, can go beyond the crystallography, we can uh, simulate heterogeneity of that structures. Okay, uh, next I will go to the second application, uh, which we will be more interesting for most of the people. So it's thermodynamic properties. And for thermodynamic properties, we're using combination of PMX and Gromax. Uh, so basically what's PMX, it's a script or it's program, yeah, it's, it, that allows you to uh, do so-called so uh, free energy perturbation calculation. So it basically generates for you topology that is suitable for that free energy perturbation uh, Simulations basically it replace your some of your amino acid with so called hy hybrid residue, which can be in two states. Yeah, it can be, for example, here valine and here is phenylalanine. So, and uh, then after that, you can do a thermodynamic cycle. Uh, so, here we have uh, for now we have uh, two properties which can calculate first is the folding free energy, and second is the dimerization free energy. So, folding we calculate with respect to the for unfolded structure, we use a very generic uh, model structure, which is just a three peptide in a solution. So glycine, some residue glycine. Yeah. And uh, we are trying to calculate this difference energy uh, between basically this and this. Uh, for that, we study in uh, three uh, mutants of the wild type GFP. Oh, four mutants, sorry, of the wild type GFP. Mm. The crystal structure is known actually, all of them are measured. Uh, and we're just trying to predict the uh, uh, free energies of folding and dimerization. Uh, yes. Okay, first uh, we have a structures comparison. And here we have again the uh, pink one, uh, blue, uh, pink, white, and uh, how it's called blue one is a uh, experimental one and the other one is uh, what we have simulated you can see that this quite well again agreement with the structures between the mutants and the non uh, and the wild type gfp and uh, here is the uh, results of our simulation free energy simulation so funny enough we found one mutant which have a particular stabilization of the folding which is this one but most importantly, we found that this mutation, which is also actually was a, the same mutation in the, but other way around, it was uh, lysine to alanine back mutation to us in RS green. But anyway, so basically mutating this uh, residue on the surface of the beta barrel with lysine, which is charged, of course, and which is very hydrophilic amino acid, uh, it renders it to prefer monomeric form, which is uh, actually very well understandable, yeah, because you, you, you're doing something which is something hydrophilic and replacing something hydrophobic is hydrophilic. And then, of course, it's starting to be less dimeric. Uh, and the dimerization, of course, actually drops a lot. So it's several, uh, it's 10 kilocalories per mole. 
Uh, okay, so then we started, of course, to investigate what's happening, why it's so, so big number. And actually what we found, even more that if you just do uh, normal dynamics of the dimer with that mutation, what you see is that in the molecular dynamics, your um, dimer starts to fall in apart. And first, uh, first thing of this is uh, that your angle between the two beta barrels become very unstable. So, and you see some rotation about this uh, around uh, this timer, like almost 40 degrees, but then it becomes very unstable. Then, so you can immediately see even with, without the free energy calculation structure that you, you have an unstable uh, system. Okay. Uh, and this actually what happened. So basically this slicing, it starts to point it to, when it was alanine, it was normal. It uh, stays here, this CH3 group. But now lysine just points outwards to the to the solvent and just prevents this, sorry, prevents this uh, tamerization. It just disrupts this tamerization interface, which is, should be made out of the hydrophobic amino acids. Okay, and finally, the third application, which I want to talk about is photochemical properties. Uh, so for that, we uh, picked up uh, absorption and fluorescence spectra, of course, which is one of the key, um, uh, key uh, property of the fluorescent proteins. Yeah, and for that we using the following approach. So basically we again do uh, large uh, molecular dynamics. From that dynamics, we again equ equidistantly pick up a snapshots. Yeah, and in that snapshots, we uh, do a short QMM simulation to relax it. And then after that, we calculate absorption spectrum. So for absorption spectrum, we calculate it for now with the EDFT, but potentially many methods can be used here. Uh, and after that, we convolve uh, total absorption spectra with Gaussian functions like this. Uh, well, here is transition type moment, there is difference in energy, uh, and so on. Okay, and uh, how to calculate fluorescence spectra? This is a more advanced thing because potentially to, ex to access the excited state, you need to do QMMM, and we actually doing also that. But then we realize that it's very long simulation, and instead of this, we just try now to provide. Uh, trying to generate yeah, the excited state for field parameters. So basically, we are trying to make forces for excited state. Uh, so trying to make we just yeah, use uh, for field for excited state. Uh, and then we do one nanosecond simulation of the excited state and calculate the emission spectra uh, from that basically fluorescent spectra. Mm. But here we can also, also do a QMM. In reality, it will be just much, much longer. Okay, so here is a spectra which we calculated. So basically, this absorption is a magenta and green one is emission. Uh, so, and we see a very distinct picture that some of the, uh, so all of them are fluoresced more or less at the same uh, position around 2.25 electron volts, but absorption differ, could differ a lot. And why it is so? Well, because actually uh, many people know, uh, many people who, who are working with the fluorescent proteins know that uh, the chromophore in that proteins could be in several protonation protein states. So it depends on the presence or absence hydrogen at this uh, OH group of the tyrosine ring, of the phenyl ring, basically. And uh, depending on that, you will have either a very small stock shift or you can have a very huge stock shift uh, because this uh, chromophore is actually photoacid. So it tries to throw out the proton upon excitation. So, and it's, it is very well known that typically the fluorescence come from the anion. So basically when you don't have proton here, but absorption can come from uh, both from anion, then it's like this, or from neutral one. And after which you see excited state proton transfer and uh, uh, see a large stock shift because of this. Okay, uh, and finally, how we can model this with excited state dynamics is just an outlook because it's now not yet in the workflow, but potentially it can be done. So here is example of the TDFT simulation, molecular dynamics uh, of that exactly pro ultra fast proton transfer. So it is very well known, not very well known, but there is some mutant in which uh, if you mutate this uh, histidine to the uh, aspartate, then you will have uh, ultra fast proton transfer, which is 
uh, scale of this is under, under the 100 femtoseconds, so it's really ultra fast. And that's how we can simulate this. So basically, we start with this configuration when the protein is exactly on the chromophore. So it's a simulation, and it almost immediately goes to the to the aspartate. Basically, it happens within like 50 femtoseconds or so. Okay, so with that, I think we are. Uh, yep, there is a short summary of my talk. So basically. We, with our Fibrocat workflow, we can do simulate. We can simulate. Uh, we can predict structures of the known mutants. We can predict thermodynamic properties of the mutants uh, without doing actual experiments. Uh, we can evaluate some photochemical properties. Uh, we have a database with fossil parameters for several chromophores and QMM parameters, and uh, yeah, we have a full basically mutagenesis protocol in silica for simulating fluorescent proteins. Uh, so some acknowledgments yeah, from our collaborators and by Excel and European Horizon program. So thanks for your attention. Anna, right, thanks very much. Yeah. So uh, as Alessandra already put in the chat, uh, everybody, please feel free to enter any questions for Dimitri in, your, uh, in the Q&A panel, Q&A box. Uh, then we will go to Mirko. Thank you very much. Um, my talk will be about, uh, uh, it's also part of the use case on the QMM simulations. I, and I want to talk about proton dynamics and mass spectrometry. So uh, proton transfer between, uh, in particular, uh, it, uh, of uh, DNA molecules and ammonium ions and the mass spectrometry conditions, so in the gas phase. And I want to first introduce uh, a bit the, um, the uh, mass spectrometry techniques, which are used commonly in, uh, in uh, biomolecular uh, applications. And yeah, the ionization process is uh, typically done with electrospay ionization. So um, uh, the uh, analytes are in, a, in an aqueous solution and spray directly through a capillar when uh, a high electric field is applied into the gas phase. And uh, one of the advantages of mass spectrometry in this setup is that uh, the uh, that it's required just the very, very low uh, concentrations of analytes. And uh, after that, droplets are formed, first with several uh, analytes inside uh, these droplets. And uh, due to um, um, solvent evaporation and uh, Coulomb uh, repulsion, uh, uh, smaller and smaller droplets are formed so that finally um, the analytes are uh, in a single droplet and then are fully desolvated um, with a complete evaporation process of, of these analytes and then can be analyzed. Uh, to study biomolecules, uh, one has to pay a bit attention and there is a specific technique which is uh, called native AZIMMS. Uh, so uh, NATO just means that uh, uh, it has to be uh, compatible between the uh, ionization process. So the solution conditions have to be compatible with, uh, uh, with the uh, ionization. Uh, but also the biomolecular system, of course, should be in the same state as would be observed under physiological conditions. And what typically gives good results is that they are uh, yeah, put into a solution of uh, 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 ammonium acetate, acetate uh, aqueous solution. And uh, to get additional insights uh, on the uh, analytes, uh, often it's coupled to the ion mobility mass spectrometry, what happens here. So after these um, analytes are yeah, desolvated and uh, the enter is so called drift tube uh, and are accelerated uh, through the electric field. And from the other side, an inert drift gas uh, entered. And uh, due to the collision uh, of the, the drift gas with the, um, with the analytes, um, which can have a, a different shape or a different uh, conformation, so a different uh, form and size. So these can be separated within this drift tube and then separately analyzed. 
So finally, uh, which are the experimental observables and uh, information we get is uh, the uh, mass and charge ratio of, uh, of the analytes and uh, the total charge distribution. And then also the collisional cross section here from these uh, separation within this drift tube, which uh, can then be related to the uh, conformations of molecules, uh, the topology of complexes, and also to identify conformational changes upon ligand binding. But of course, at, at a low resolution, and here comes uh, molecular dynamics and uh, term NM simulations into play to get an atomistic insight into these. Um, uh, biomolecular systems. And in my talk, I will focus uh, on uh, DNA in the gas phase and a typical computational protocol, which is done as uh, I outlined here uh, to, uh, yeah, to uh, simulate these uh, DNA molecules in the gas phase. So at first one typically runs in classical uh, MD simulations in aqueous solution. Uh, then one selects randomly snapshots or modern clusters, different conformations and uh, select snapshots and uh, removes the uh, molecules. For DNA, um, the, uh, the DNA backbone has to be, um, um, yeah, has to be protonated in the form that uh, the experimental observed uh, total charge state is, uh, is obtained, but that I will discuss uh, later. And uh, then one can run uh, extended gas phase simulations and derive the properties and compare with the experimental results. And from our stuff, from the simulations, uh, get atomistic details uh, between of the biomolecules, uh, of the conformations, or uh, on the, of the type of the complexes. An interesting um, uh, application was uh, published by uh, the group of Modesto Roscoe. Um, who studied uh, the DNA of an, uh, of an complex here. And they figured out that just selecting the uh, randomly snapshots and removing the solvent, uh, they could not uh, reproduce the uh, experimental collisional cross sections of such molecules, even uh, if they sample up to the microsecond time scale. And uh, what they did is uh, they um, then uh, tested or, or carried out an um, and uh, 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 or simulated the evaporation process. And uh, so they started from uh, such a water droplet and uh, then uh, simulated these in the gas phase. Water is released. And what they observed is um, that during this evaporation process, already the uh, DNA uh, duplex is, uh, is compact or compact and uh, the size is. Uh, decreased and starting from these um, configurations, then they finally uh, could uh, get reasonable or good results in comparison to the experimental data. So I want to talk about a bit more on, on the proton dynamics in the gas phase, uh, also on DNA. And uh, of course, in biomolecular simulations, we typically apply uh, classical force fields uh, to study uh, uh, which um, uh, then we cannot study uh, proton transfer reactions. Um, so it's uh, very suitable for the QMM methodology and, um, uh, and also in a previous study and, and the group of uh, Professor Morosco and uh, Paolo Caloni uh, from Ulich. Um, they studied uh, the proton dynamics uh, of single oligonyl nucleotides in the gas phase. So this is, uh, which will also be a uh, focus uh, of, of, my, um, of, of my results. And um, uh, the structure as shown here, it's a heptanucleotide, which has such a hairpin form and aqueous solution and uh, consisting of a short BDNA fragment and then here in, uh, a DNA loop. And in the gas phase, one has to localize, as I mentioned before, uh, charges uh, at the uh, phosphate backbones. And uh, from QMNM and up initial MD simulations, we studied different uh, hydronation, uh, or, or hydronation patterns. And what they observe is that in gas phase, protons can uh, be transferred between uh, adjacent uh, phosphate groups, uh, but also can induce 
uh, structural changes, for example, um, if these uh, phosphate groups moves up here, it can form a different uh, hydrogen bonding pattern. And uh, yeah, which can alter the, uh, the, the, um, the shape of the molecule and the conformation of the molecule, which is then related with experimental observations. That was, was not studied so far. So they studied such uh, isolated uh, molecules. Uh, what was not studied so far is uh, the protonation process of uh, the DNA uh, from the counter ions, uh, which are uh, in the experimental setup. So uh, uh, DNA is known uh, to be polyionic uh, with negatively charged uh, phosphate backbones. Um, but the energetics the metal be differ in the, in the gas phase. Uh, so uh, the backbone is uh, a, a significant portion is um, protonated. And since uh, in the experimental setup, there's ammonium acetate, the proton transfer is likely to come from uh, ammonium ions uh, to the DNA backbone, followed by dissociation of uh, NH3. And just as a uh, brief illustration, I've shown here the uh, a model system, ammonium ions and uh, dimethyl phosphate, which is known to be fully surveyed uh, from the PKA values one can see it uh, under solution conditions. But if we move to the gas phase, I've just here scanned the, uh, the uh, transfer of a proton to, to, the DNA, uh, to the DNA. I've made a relaxed surface scan and monitored the electronic energy and we observe in the gas phase, of course, here. Uh, the uh, neutral bond is much more stable and also for a small illustration we simulated these uh, with Apenitia and the molecular dynamics uh, where the ammonium ion and the uh, dimethyl phosphate is in, in the gas phase and uh, we simulated this process and uh, due to uh, Coulomb attraction they meet each other and uh, they immediately transfer these uh, this proton. So we wanted to study the protonation of the DNA uh, and the counter ion complex along the evaporation process of such DNA molecules. So first of all, a bit uh, what one has to do, at, of course, is that first uh, with the uh, proprietary work. So uh, molecular dynamics and the aqueous solution. We re-examined re uh, the solution uh, the aqueous solution structure of the septa nucleotide and also in our simulations. Uh, so with uh, ammonium ion as counter ions as in the uh, experimental conditions and carried out uh, 500 nanosecond uh, classical MD simulations also in collaboration with uh, Modesto Roscoe's group from Barcelona. And in fact, we see what we have expected that uh, these hairpin structure here, uh, what's shown here is uh, is preserved during the whole simulation. Um, so no strong fluctuations of the uh, RMSD values. And uh, then we analyzed also the formation of transient ammonium phosphate pairs. And as mentioned before in the solution, uh, there are only just a few transient pairs so that uh, there are no stable complexes formed. And these are just 100 from 550 uh, from 5,000 structures, so in the low percent region and not long lived. We have then simulated the evaporation process, and I want also to go a bit to the uh, technical setups in my talk. So, from our aqueous uh, solution simulations, we cut uh, droplets with uh, uh, around the center of mass of the DNA molecule. And then we run uh, 500 uh, picosecond chunks of uh, gas phase MD simulations for these gas phase simulations. Uh, these can also be done with Gromax, so just as information, one has to use a large simulation box and then uh, direct Coulomb summation to evaluate uh, electrostatics and uh, that the uh, periodic images uh, are not uh, interacting with each other. And uh, during this, uh, during this uh, computational protocol, water molecules are released, which are shown here. So at the first stage, it's more or less released linearly with simulation time. And uh, at some stage, uh, when only a few waters are still available, 
uh, they get much more stickier because of stronger electrostatic interactions and no solvent screening anymore. And to remove the last one, one typically also increase the temperature during this process. The ammonium ions instead, uh, they do not ev uh, ev evaporate. So they, uh, at the first stage, they uh, prefer to be in, let's say, in the more solvated state. But um, after a, a specific time, when more and more water released, they interact much stronger with the DNA molecule and form afterwards also here. So they approach uh, specific uh, phosphate groups and uh, form stable complexes afterwards. And from these uh, snapshots or from these simulations, we are then going to uh, analyze proton transfer reactions, or proton transfer between uh, the ammonium ions and the phosphate groups and uh, some general considerations, uh, which I've done uh, when I carried out this project was, of course, we have somehow to yeah, identify uh, suitable configurations and uh, there are the descriptors I typically use. So at first, of course, the uh, total number of water molecules, which is also, of course, related with the time span uh, of the evaporation process, so more, more water is released. Then, of course, uh, we selected the one which has an, uh, uh, which uh, showed uh, contact ion pairs, so the distance between the ammonium ions and the DS DNA phosphate groups. And uh, as a third one, also the uh, local coordination number of uh, ammonium ions to characterize if there are much, or if there are a lot uh, remaining water molecules uh, coordinating with them. We applied then uh, uh, QMM, and there are two. Uh, yeah, interfaces uh, which are developed and by Excel we applied. Um, the first one is uh, MIMIC, which couples uh, CPND and Romux. It uses a DFT uh, with a plain wave pseudo potential approach. And uh, the second one I will yeah, focus on my talk is uh, the Romux CP2K interface, uh, which uses DFT with a mixed Gaussian and plane wave uh, approach and the multi grid implementation. <clears throat> so after we identified suitable, suitable snapshots, one has to think about the uh, QMM mythology and uh, in the first part, of course, uh, which atoms have to be in the uh, QM region. And um, um, I've shown here, I've highlighted them with, uh, uh, with spheres. You can see here, of course, the ammonium ion is uh, shown to be in the uh, QM region. And then the uh, proton uh, acceptor, the uh, phosphate group, and uh, then parts of the DNA backbone, including the less oxyribose sugar and uh, some carbons. And uh, red, we have then to cut covalent bonds. Um, and uh, we choose um, these C4, C5 prime bonds, and also the uh, we cut it here along the uh, C1 prime and here the nitrogen atom from the nucleobase. So that in fact, this one would comprise the QM region. And uh, yeah, we then used, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, Romax CP2P interface with the uh, GPW approach uh, with DFD and uh, uh, PBE functional. And then the first stage, which is, uh, one has to do is to uh, yeah, benchmark the QM settings and we benchmark the plane wave cutoff, uh, the relative uh, cutoff for the uh, multi-grid approach and also the number of grid of the multi, uh, of the, yeah, multi-grids. Considering the performance uh, of QM MM simulations, um, which uses the hybrid uh, MPI OpenMP uh, open uh, parallelization. We benchmark them before starting the uh, simulations. And uh, we find that up to uh, 96 uh, cores, so two nodes uh, with 12 tasks per nodes and uh, four CPUs per task. Uh, we have a reasonable performance or a good performance. And uh, with that setup, we were able to simulate 3.5 to 6.0 uh, 
uh, picoseconds a day, but dependent on the QM size. We have then um, carried out these QMM simulations, and uh, I want to go through this approach. Um, in the first stage, we are minimizing. Uh, we have, or we come from uh, MD uh, snapshots with the MD potential, and uh, it's a good to uh, first minimize and to adapt to the new QMM potential. So to minimize uh, in, in a few thousand steps or so two thousand steps, we used. We then reheated the system um, from zero Kelvin to uh, 3000 Kelvin and uh, 5000 steps with a yeah, step size of 0 0.5 femtoseconds, which is typically used in QM simulations. We equilibrated afterwards the, uh, the system uh, at 300 Kelvin. And then we were interested in scanning the protonation or the proton transfer uh, or the Prefer, or we were interested in the preferred uh, position of the uh, of the proton in these uh, DNA uh, ammonium complex, and uh, we would then scan these uh, proton uh, coordinate. Uh, for that, we used uh, Gromax and CP2K, which was patched with Plumed, so that one can uh, also apply uh, the functionalities of Plumed for for bias simulations. And we use a simple uh, proton transfer coordinate, which is the difference distance between the uh, NH bond and the uh, HO bond. And uh, in the first step, we just scan the uh, these protonation or these uh, coordinate. Uh, we moved at first here, it's from here, we moved first to the ionic configurations and then scanned the coordinate and for other 2.5 uh, picoseconds uh, QMM simulations. Finally, uh, we carried out umbrella sampling uh, to get uh, these local protonation or proton transfer profiles with different uh, starting configurations uh, upon this evaporation process. Um, uh, we used uh, 10 equidistant uh, windows uh, in the range of uh, minus 1.0 to 0 0.8. So minus means it's the Yana configuration and uh, plus means it's the neutral configuration. And for all these, uh, for these 10 different windows, we uh, carried out uh, 25 picoseconds QMM simulations uh, to recover the energetic profile uh, along these uh, proton transfer coordinate. And what we observed is uh, what we see is uh, that we get uh, ionic configurations, um, which is um, or that we have uh, configurations where we have these ionic uh, profiles so that uh, it's not yeah, preferred to, to transfer the proton, but we have also observed uh, proton transfer configurations where the uh, proton from the ammonium complex can be easily transferred to the um, uh, to the um, DNA backbone and finally to, uh, uh, and then to dissociate. Yeah, these simulations are in the uh, final stage of analysis and also prepared now for publication. And yeah, I hope I could show you some interest and details on the uh, proton dynamics uh, between ammonium ion and DNA and then the relation to uh, the experimental um, yeah, importance. And yeah, with that, I want to close my talk and give over to Arno, I think. All right, thank you very much, Mirko. And thank you very much, Dimitri, as well. These nice talks. Uh, I think it was nice that we also included some, uh, you know, shared some methodological details as well, which uh, are not always presented, but I think it's very useful for people to see. So we have some questions, uh, which I'll go ahead with now. Anybody who hasn't asked her question yet, please feel free to still do so. First question is for Dmitri. Comment is uh, from Mohammed. It's very nice talk. He has a question: If the fluorophore is covalently bonded to the protein, how to deal with it? Uh, okay, the question, <laughs> yeah, of course. So basically there's two options. So, uh, most of the 
fluorescent proteins actually have the chromophore bound into the embedded into the uh, amino acid chain because it's formed out of the amino acids. It's after catalytically formed. And how to deal with it in molecular dynamics, you typically define a new residue. Uh, and that's how we are doing. Basically, we have a, a amino acid residues database where we have a special uh, residues for the chromophores. Uh, some of the fluorescent proteins, however, there is several, like for example, ASFP code. They, uh, in them, uh, the chromophores cleaved so basically it's cleaved, I mean, it's it's separated from the protein itself. So there is two reactions going first after the formation and then cleaves. Uh, then you have a separate chain basically. Yeah? So basically your protein is forms to chain. Uh, so that's a question. So basically you need a specific special residue for the for the force field and you need to parameterize. And this actually consumes a lot of time. This is the main time consuming part because you need to, to do this. And I guess I can do the second question. Yeah, uh, I can read it out just for uh, okay, okay. consistency. Thank you very much. Uh, the second question is, how much do we have to simulate a system after mutation to see if there is a conformational change? Okay, uh, the, there is a very tricky question because actually it depends on the size of your system. Uh, as I showed you in one of the slides, uh, typically you need to see at least that your backbone is stop uh, fluctuating. And if it starts fluctuating, so when you see that your RMSD is changing, uh, you need to, to be sure that you capture the transition from one state to another state several times, yeah? Uh, just look into the dynamics, look into the dynamical parameters like RMSD, like uh, try to clusterize, uh, try to build, uh, to see how many uh, populations you see and try to see what is, uh, what, what is the transfer time between this population. Only after that you can say, well, you can say that is it enough or is not enough? <laughs> because molecular dynamics is never enough. In our, in our work, we done from 100 nanoseconds up to half of the uh, microsecond, basically, trajectories. Hmm. Okay, thanks. I think next question is for Mirko. Uh, the question is, what is the shape of the box of water molecules during solvation? Is it octahedral? If so, then what's the advantage of using octahedral box rather than cubic? And also, does the shape of the water box have any effect on the MD simulation or QMM simulation? Um, so um, the the box I use the cubic box. In my, uh, so in the aqueous solution uh, simulation, I think it was asked, and uh, I used uh, one can also use an octahedral box. And uh, the advantage is, of course, uh, that you have less water inside. Uh, less water molecules, and this will speed up the uh, simulations. But I was not focusing on the aqueous solution, so these 500 nanoseconds uh, was on the small DNA fragment was small enough that I can set up a, briefly such an um, um, yeah such simulations and uh, carry out these simulations with um, I don't know remember <laughs> anymore. It was not uh, much simulation time required, so computation time required. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Next question, also from Mirko, is uh, and this is about the QMM, QMM, and the QM treatment and parameterization. Could you comment on your cutting of the C N covalent bond? Did you do some tests on it? Um, I did also simulations where where these are inside and uh, uh, where the nuclear base was uh, inside the QM regions, um, and I did not find any, um, yeah, any issue. And cutting this bond. So I cannot hear that you should not cut pi system if it's not a pi. Uh, it's not a pi system. Bond, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> then there is no problem typically. Yeah. Any single bond you can cut pretty safe. Yeah. So and that reduces, of course, the computational cost. So and was already done also in, in, in the literature. So. But actually, if you do protein simulations, never cut over the peptide bond. Peptide bond is a pi system between. No, C no, and no. <laughs> That's, that's Sorry. In the case of proteins, you should not do that. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, next question is uh, from the same person. Is uh, is is it uh, the question? Is is it is it, grow, is it used at Lumet patched to get the you know descriptors of the yeah. Um Is it is it Chromex that's Plumet patched, which is possible, or is the CPTK that's Plumet patched, which is also possible, or is it or is it both? In other words, where is the Plumet patching that you're calling in when you're running these simulations? Uh, 
Uh, it's patched with, so Gromax is the uh, MD driver for these uh, QNMM simulations. So it's patched with Gromax. For Mimic, it's uh, where, it, where it uses CPMD, where it, uh, CPMD is a molecular dynamics driver there. It would be patched with uh, CPMD, but maybe probably Dimitri would have more, yes, more I can, information uh, yes. about that. <laughs> yes, so uh, I can say you that uh, for what done Mirka, of course, it was Gromax patched with, with, uh, with uh, plant, but uh, fortunately enough, in Gromax 2022, we now have uh, the so-called transformation pooling uh, variables, and they can suit the same exactly collect as collective variables used by Mirka. So you even don't need to patch Gromax's plant now to make the same kind of thing, because it's already in Gromax. The similar functionality is already inside the Gromax itself from 2022. Okay, then a question from Mirko. Why are we simulating at 300 Kelvin? Shouldn't we be simulating at physiological temperature at 310 Kelvin? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah that's a good question. Also uh, related to mass spectrometry, it's not really clear what temperature it has to be. So uh, typically I think it's the experiments often set up at 300 Kelvin. So I decided to go to 300 Kelvin. Yeah, okay. Uh, then a question for, for both. Uh, do we need to install Gromax in double precision to use along with CP2K? It's probably a question for Dimitri, actually. Yes, because I'm actually developing that interface, but yeah. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, typically I would say that, yes, you need to install the Gromax in double precision if you want to. So typically QM is very sensitive to the precision. The problem is not with Gromax, the problem is with QM. Uh, QM is very sensitive and a single precision is typically not enough. Uh, the single precision of coordinates which will provide by Gromax will be not enough. So yes, you need to do a Gromax in double precision. Uh, you don't need, you can do it in single precision, but I really strongly suggest to compile this double precision. So. <laughs> and the follow-up question from that, I think is, is double precision is slow with GPU, but I think that's a point about, perhaps about Gromax, where it's really the, 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 the performance here depends on the CP2K and you okay. need precision for CP2K, so. So maybe Arna, you can say more about GVU and CP2K. Next, yeah, in the, in the next webinar, which I will mention. At, at yes, the, so in, in two weeks yeah. will be a webinar where it will be discussed specifically the scaling. Because the thing is for QMMM, your, uh, your performance is not almost not dependent on the Gromax. It's fully dependent on the QM code. Uh, and it depends on how uh, effectively your QM code can use GPUs. And it will be in the next webinar, I guess, yeah. Then uh, Alexis says, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, and this is the question is for Mirko is uh, you mentioned two scenarios from your umbrella sampling simulations, namely double well potential, almost equal potential wells and ionic with one minimum and no proton transfer. Can you please explain what are the prerequisites of each of them to take place? Do you obtain them under the different initial conditions? And there are different initial conditions, which uh, I've shown with the descriptor. So a different amount of water molecules, of course, around, uh, and also interactions of the ammonium ion with, uh, uh, not with a single uh, phosphate group, uh, maybe also with a, a second phosphate group, which is close by. Okay. Uh, question for, I think this one is also for um, the Mirko, which is what is the time step you used for the QMM simulations? 0 0.5 uh, femtosecond. Okay, thank you very much. Um, those, are all the questions, those are all the questions we have uh, from the audience. Um, I, uh, I have one more question for both of you, which is that, uh, how did you choose your, why did you choose the functional you chose? Uh, uh, why did you choose the basic set you choose? Uh, how did you choose the QM system size? You did, you, Mirko, you said you did some benchmarking. So you changed, yeah. you, you grew and shrunk this. Um, but if you have any comments that you think are useful tips for people. Um... Yeah, uh, okay. Of course, uh, benchmarking everything as I've shown, <laughs> that's uh, always a good idea. And uh, of course, looking in the literature if uh, similar studies have been done and uh, yeah, getting some inspirations and uh, yeah, some information on uh, which type uh, of uh, functionals to use for the specific problem or uh, which QM size is required. There are also a lot of studies then uh, yeah, depends always on the problem, of course. Yeah. I can add here that, uh, especially if you are a PhD student or whatever, do not try to develop the bicycle. Uh, most probably a system has already been studied and just look into the literature 
and only in the case if you see that no one ever studied similar systems, then do a full scale benchmark of your functional, of your basis set and the size of your QM system. And for that, we have a very good, last year, we have a very good uh, webinar series on the QMMM best practices where the uh, professional, yeah, high, high level scientists in that field, they are taught how to benchmark each of these things. Yeah, I've just put a link in the chat to everyone with a link to that workshop. Okay, thank you both again very much uh, for your talks. Uh, and thanks everyone for attending. I just want to sh share some details about um, the um, next webinar that is happening. So I stopped sharing, right? <laughs> yeah, I've already so. over, over taken over. So uh, the next webinar that's happening by some webinar in two weeks time is related to this. Uh, it's uh, by uh, my, my colleague here at EPCC, um, uh, Holly Judge and myself talking about um, efficient uh, usage of Chromax with CP2K or really CP2K uh, to do QMM uh, simulation of biomolecular systems. So we will look a bit in a little bit more detail about uh, the performance that you can get and how you use uh, both uh, different kinds of processors and, and GPUs. So hopefully that will be uh, of interest to people. So with that, uh, I wanted to thank everybody again uh, for attending. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this um, and I hope to see you at the next BioXL webinar. Goodbye everyone. Bye everyone. Goodbye everyone. <laughs>